Hello, I'm Lorenzo and you're watching KSP to Mars. This is episode 26, where we will do many things. This is an episode that will not have lengthy burns. It will have rapid-fire missions that achieve science points and progress, hopefully. First things first is to retire all our old ships that we don't need anymore. El Topaz, never mentioned by name, that was a nuclear reactor prototype that crashed, so we're going to retire that. The Explorer Mark 1, I have no idea what that was, so it's probably useless. The IPL-1, this is the interplanetary one, that's currently on its way to Uranus, we're going to stay, stick with that, that is that might be useful for different launch windows. The Lab Crew Hab was a um, shoddily engineered transfer vehicle for crew with a as yet untested but still on orbit heat shield, we are going to delete that one. Delete, delete, delete. The Luna 1, our obsolete moon lander, going to delete that one. The Luna 2, the roboticized rescue vehicle, deleting that one. That didn't work. The Luna Lander Mark 2, this is one that successfully returned last episode. We're definitely going to keep that. New Ground 3 and 4, those are bigger and better boosters, but from a bygone era. So we are deleting that. New Grounds 1, of course, as well. 2, this was playing around with the smaller rockets. We don't really need that. And the SP probably stands for Science Points or something like that. The Newgrounds Science Large is the Newgrounds Rocket with Science Payload. The Newgrounds 3 with a Materials Bay, deleting that. And of course the G00 or Goo version as well. The Resident Nuke is a nuclear reactor that's sitting next to the launch pad being all nuclear. We'll leave that there, but we can delete the blueprints. The Tech Lab 1 is the research lab that's currently orbiting, but that is grossly underpowered and obsolete, so we're going to delete that one as well. So, we have the warp ship now, that's just a pod to put on the launch pad and do time warp if necessary. The Luna Lander, that is our moon return and landing capable vehicle, and the interplanetary probe ship. So, let's build a new one, shall we? We need something to uh, gather science from lunar space, high and low over the moon. So a flyby and a safe return. That's not too complicated, I don't think. Bim bam boom, easy as one, two, three. Here we have a ship. Now, this is how I design most of my ships these days. I make a nuclear engine with all the payload. Um, this is manned, by the way, not because the Kerbal needs to do observations, beca but because he has to go outside and retrieve the data in these experiments to take that back into the pod, that so they can r survive re-entry, obviously. Then what I do, I put a stack decoupler under it, as is often the case. A size adapter, if I can find where that is while talking, it's so, so difficult to be a rocket designer. A size adapter, then I go to the sub-assemblies and grab the skipper booster. That's the booster with all the skipper engines. Grab that, and it takes a while to load in the 254 parts. Stick that under the payload. It takes a little bit of fiddling to get it just right, and there we go. A lunar capable rocket, all that remains is to stick on the fairings. Let's do that, so a little bit of fiddling again, and there we go, fairings attached. And we have a rocket with 18.6 meters per second of delta V, which should be enough for a lunar flyby. Um, this one will not be able to land and return, as previous ones did, but then again it won't have to, so I skimped a bit on the uh, on the lander stage. That could have carried more fuel, but there's no point, and now the liftoff stage has a slightly higher thrust to weight ratio. Not a huge deal, but a little bit of a deal. Um, I'll call it the Luna Space Sampler. Save that. Nothing revolutionary there. And before we move to the launch pad, let me tell you what the point of today's and indeed possibly the few future episodes are. If we peruse the Kerbal alarm clock, which we cannot do for some arcane reason. Uh, anyway, let me tell you, we have a launch window coming up to Juna in about a year. And uh, three other launch windows to different planets in a hundred days. I'm in the crew building, I don't want to be in the crew building, I want to be in the research building. Uh, we have uh, launch windows coming up and we need science. And science can be had through lunar excursion missions, lunar excursion missions of course, 
and through a science lab. The science lab I have currently launched in orbit is the stock laboratory that does not have these wonderful science generating functions of the KSP interstellar lab that's hidden away somewhere in this tech tree. I finally caved and looked on the internet to see what the tech progression is like and didn't peruse all of it but I had a little bit of a cheat and we need to get this electronics which is a good bet anyway because it unlocks two sensors and then somewhere in this vicinity a advanced science thingy will open up and that will let us have a special science lab that will well basically serve as our um, stepping stone for space station and s orbital research and that gives us science if we fuel it with a nuclear power plant I want that because then we get new things to design and play with so the goal now until we have um, our Mars transfer window our goal now is to first send Richard B to the moon to do science in orbit there or well in the space near the moon and to again launch a science laboratory up into Kerbin orbit with a nuclear reactor and some radiators to shed the heat and docking ports which we now have um, and then that station can be gradually built upon much as our international space station in the real world is constructed for now though first things first getting some science points and I'm going to launch Richby to the moon for that. This is a process that you have seen in full, in part, and in bits many times already, so I'm not going to bore you with it again. I will see you when something interesting has occurred. What you are seeing here is a rocket that's in trouble. It might not immediately be apparent, but when two of the three stack booster tanks ran out, it became apparent that, well, it's hidden in the shade now, that one of the boosters had sheared off uh, ditching its top tank, running out before the others and thus imbalancing the rocket. Um, being a quick pilot as I was, I immediately disabled two other engines uh, hoping to fix the imbalance that way. Of course the fuel is still distributed unbalanced because uh, well, the stuff is broken and there is just a tank that's basically falling off. However, so far we have not had a mission failure yet. We have tumbled through the sky a bit, no doubt, lost a lot of Delta V. Well, wasted a lot of Delta V and, well, uh, for, for go, for went a few. Um, a few. For went some Delta V because of well, shutting down those engines and not burning the fuel. But we are still on a somewhat decent course. We are still packing on speed. We're still going up. And we did have some Delta V to spare on this mission. Because remember, we are only trying to get close to the moon. We are not intending on landing on it or anywhere um, and getting off of it again. So I'm not scrubbing the mission, but it will be interesting to see if we can, in fact, make it like this. From now on, the rocket should control like normal again and I'll be back with you when we either do or don't make a lunar intercept so see you then and there we are collected the data from the experiments we did a close pass by the moon at 30 kilometers on the dark side and this should give us about a hundred and 180 and change in science if we can get back of course and with getting back now all I mean is getting riches be back into the capsule because this camera is going completely nuts this happened on my last EVA as well I don't know what causes it or if it's even a problem or maybe on myself I'm causing it but sometimes the Kerbals they go completely haywire and uh, the camera no the camera actually goes haywire not so much the Kerbals making it very hard to get them into the command pod but at least it seems to be a, see that's what I mean damn it the camera jerks around the Gerbil cr tries to fix his orientation and that in the process of doing that he bumps against his rocket and gets flung off into space at any rate the rocket and therefore also riches be here are on a re-entry trajectory back to Kerbin so with or without the Kerbal the rocket is going to re-enter but the parachute has not been deployed yet and we do need riches be for that look there's all the science and he is safely back in the pod I put the periapsis at well I originally put it at 78 it's crept back up to 83 let's push that back down we're now at 74 Let's increase that a little bit. Remember last time we had 65 
Um, that basically crushed the poor Kerbal, so I'm going to go with 78 this time around and hope that that will in fact work for Richby. So 76, 77 and a half, that's going to do it. Let's time warp down into that atmosphere. And it is quite a way away yet, it's three days, three days and 15 hours out so we can safely punch the time warp. Well, punch it a bit. With these elliptical orbits, if you are at too high a time warp, it is very much possible to skip from one end of the orbit way out into space again, just bypassing the planet altogether, just in one time step. And of course, that's not very realistic and counterproductive because we do want to re enter the atmosphere. Let's see, periapsis is still at 77.5 kilometers. That has remained constant, and that means that we are now free to ditch the rocket. Bye bye, that will re enter on its own, and that just leaves us to properly orient the capsule for re entry. Aerodynamic forces should keep it stable, but of course, we have our reaction wheel as well as a sort of stability insurance. So let's see, we're finally coming up on the atmospheric interface. The re entry is going to be a fiery one again. We're coming in at just a hair under 11 kilometers per second. That's just a few hundred meters per second shy of actual escape velocity, um, which would shoot us off into solar space. That is not going to happen, but we are for sure going to encounter some heating and some G forces. Remember, with the Ferrum Aerospace model and this pod that has weirdly high drag values, or it's just very, very bluntly shaped. Uh, we have not so far uh, discovered a safe, viable re-entry corridor. I'm hoping this is going to be the ticket 78 kilometers from a lunar height at about 11 kilometers per second. If we do make it, then Riches B will be the first Kerbal to come back from the vicinity of the moon and live. And that's an achievement in and of itself, I do think. So, let's have a look at how this goes. Nothing to it but to wait. We have four store dates and of course as usual if the G indicator is getting in the crew critical area, this is the red bit here, I'm going to hit the parachute so that, that it deploys even if Riches B happens to die. So we can see when we right click on the pod how much drag it is experiencing. It's currently experiencing experiencing 7 kilonewtons. That is a fair amount yet, but not uh, enough to sufficiently slow the rocket down. Well, it's not a rocket anymore, just a re-entry capsule. It is starting to increase, nearing coming on 10 kilonewtons. We are now decelerating at a 1G level and we are getting the first heating effects. Coming up onto 10 kilonewtons, this is the amount of thrust that one of the small engines has. Actually, no, it's not. It's somewhere in the middle. The nuclear engine though has 60 kilonewtons, so it's not we're not quite decelerating as if a nuclear engine were, were pushing on us. On the other hand, this is just the capsule, um, no heavy engines to push around. We are decelerating at one full G now. Heating up slightly, nothing major, but there is some slight heating here. And our periapsis has magically been altered to 82 kilometers. Oh! Of course, because we separated the rocket, our trajectory was altered, and the periapsis now then is 82 kilometers. I have a hunch that this is far too high for a immediate re-entry, although we are slowing down a little bit. Um, that means that, unfortunately, Riches B is going to have to make a few passes, and I will not subject you to that. So see you when we are, in fact, re-entering. So, after two more passes at 82 and 81 kilometers, we are now coming in for a re-entry at 77 kilometers, the original planned height, and we are coming in at a speed of about 8.5 kilometers per second instead of 11, so that's a lot more sedate, and, well, that can only be good. Where we have less, ooh, we have less speed to bleed off, so there is less chance of well, guaranteed destruction, really. So once again, we're going to open up this um, command pod, engage some physical time warp for the tedious bits, and see what's going to happen. Look how beautifully aerodynamically stable the pod is, blunt and first. Nevertheless, I'm going to activate the SAS system to keep it rock solid, just in case, just to be sure. So 
I'm expecting this pass to be the the decisive one where we will for sure forever re-enter the atmosphere and hopefully Richesby is not going to be crushed in the process. I'm going to come off the physical warp in just a bit. Yeah, this game switch to surface mode. I think that means we are definitely bound for the surface. Let's have a peek at the map view. And yes, we do. Our apoapsis is now 130 and plummeting and we don't have a periapsis anymore, so we are definitely re-entering for real this time. 10 kilonewtons of aerodynamic drag, 78 kilometers, and 7.5 kilometers per second of speed yet to scrub. We are at 1G, and that is rising now. So I wonder, I hope, if uh, I hope the G's won't rise too quickly, that Riches B will survive, and he will in fact be the first Kerbal to do so. Uh, and by doing so, I of course mean surviving a uh, high-speed re-entry from lunar altitudes. So, let us see what happens. The G's are now rising. We're at 2G and 7 kilometers per second remaining. The heat shield is doing fine. It's not ablating as of yet. We're 20 kilonewtons now. That's one-third of a nuclear engine slowing us down. 2 G's here. Of course, this hypothetical nuclear engine would push without being burdened by the weight of the engine itself or any of its fuel. So the effect on the capsule is a lot more than it were uh, than than a nuclear engine would have. Even though the thrust, the force imparted on the capsule, is um, well, it's lower. So here we go. We are at 35 kilonewtons now, coming up to four. Four and a half G's, six kilometers per second remaining, and we're now at 65 kilometers altitude. That fateful height that previously crushed Riches We were going a good clip faster than though. Six kilometers per second, five to go until a safe speed, and we're coming up on five G's. Rich is still fine though, five is par for the course. He has trained for that. That doesn't worry him. Coming up to six, and we have five kilometers per second to go. Four until we have a reasonable safe speed. Reaching seven Gs. Riches B is starting to be uncomfortable, but again, this is something he is prepared for. The heat shield is more than fine. It's only ablating piecemeal. Oh, there we have nine Gs. This re-entry is starting to get really hairy on Riches B now. Nine Gs, but we're... The quick deceleration does also mean that it's going to be over really quickly. We have three kilometers per second more to scrub, or really two, because then we'll be traveling at two kilo at one kilometer per second, and that is a safe speed. Doesn't look as though we're going over 10 Gs. That's just tickling the danger zone there, but it does seem as if Richesby is going to survive. The Gs are falling now. We're going through eight, back to seven, and our speed is almost gone. We have 1,300 meters per second remaining. That does mean that Riches B is officially the first Kerbal to survive a re-entry from lunar height. All that he needs to do now is deploy his parachute, which he will do now, and then is nothing but the rather tedious wait until we hit the surface. So I'm not going to share that with you. I'm instead going to rejoin you when we are in fact landed so see you then and there we are finally landed let's recover this vessel quickly and get all of our science and we should get a few points I think the next goals for science will be landing on again on the moon in different biomes and returning that uh, we today we got 188.9 science bringing our total to 306 and that means I think that we are able to get those new science, uh, these, those new science tools. Uh, let's have a look. See here, not this, not this, not this, but this. We're going to get electronics. Yes, we're going to get electronics and get the seismic accelerometers reading, and the magnetometer and the gamma ray spectrometer. So, 300 science at electronics. Great. And what is that here? Advanced science tech. This is exactly what we need now. We need 550 points for that. It will be our most advanced technology. And look at that. Then we get a science laboratory from the KSP Interstellar guys. That's only That only weighs two and a half um, tons. So we are going to use that for starting a space station. You also get the GravMax negative gravioli detector and this, if I recall correctly, gives a lot of science points. So we get to revisit Mail quite... what the hell was that kind of sound? 
we get to revisit a lot of our previous destinations and re-science them. And we get an in situ resource, um, an in situ, in situ refinery unit or in situ re resource utilization unit. We get to mine resources. Um, yes, yes, things to play with. Things to play with. That's exactly what we need. What? So many points. We definitely want this. So we're going to make a beeline for the 550 science and have a look at that. So see you in a bit with a science vessel. Right, and here we are on the launch pad with a singularly purposed vessel. It's called the science vessel and it's crewed by Rich's BR Moon Flyby Veteran. We're going to give these new toys a spin. Let's see, the gamma ray spectrometer. It has a uranium abundance of 7.6 parts per million and a thorium abundance of 24.8 parts per million, per million. That should be higher because there's many a nuclear reactor splashed around here. Display the uranium hotspots. Display, display the uranium hotspots. Where are we supposed to see that? I have no idea and we will leave that for another day. Let's have a look here at the seismic accelerometer. Log seismic data. A seismic scan from the launch pad. Great, we can keep that. This is a this is a pity because we're going to have to recover the vessel and do it again to get the data. And I think seismic data should be recoverable. Anyway, activate magnetometer. Wow, that is an amazing piece of kit. Ooh, there is some. These are some magnet magnetic readings, I think. And I have no idea what they mean except that it's quite a low amount of Teslas in magnetosphere. Let's see if we can log the magnetospheric data. Analyze magnetosphere can't be done right now. Well, that's a pity. That's a less science than I was counting on. And we can log the temperature data. Let's, well, recover the vessel for those three points. Well, let's do it and then we can see uh, what we get by flying anywhere. Otherwise, we're going to do the seismic data from, of course, the KSC and the runway. Free science points are, of course, still free science points. And we need to scrounge up every single one of them because we're on our way to 550 science points to get that laboratory to start the space station to start to really kickstart the generation of science. At least I think that's how it will work. I want to do that magnetosphere reading. Maybe that has to be in space or something. Log magnetosphere data. Activate magnetometer. Deactivate magnetometer. Right. Anyway, let's throttle this rocket up and land it somewhere else. So, here we go. And let's see if we can't make that scan happen. Ooh, make that scan happen from the air that doesn't work either so in that case I'm just going to go ahead and do a seismic scan of the launch pad oh this is going completely out of control perhaps not unsurprisingly oh no 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 mm. well done Rich's B is at least safe and we are going to come down for a landing somewhat hard landing on the uh, not the launch pad on the runway here so six data for that lock the sphere data that can't be done and well I have no idea what that does and this does something for us here keep the data well that was rather pointless but we did play around with that new magnetometer and I think it's about time we put a new satellite in orbit that uh, well that makes use of this stuff. So I'm going to design. And here we are back with the modular space station 2B. Turns out the space station we launched earlier was premature and here we have the the new one with docking ports, two on the side here and one on the top that also houses the remote control cord which will be jettisoned by uh, separatrons once in orbit. We have a rudimentary power system, four solar panels and four batteries and of course the lab full of science experiments. 
this is a rudimentary power system because as soon as we have electrical generators we will send up dedicated nuclear reactors to attach to this station which will then provide it all the power it needs. reason we're not doing that today is that I don't have space capable radiators yet so nor do I have the electric generator so I could attach a nuclear reactor but it would do nothing but produce heat and be an annoyance so let us grab the booster we always use and see how far it can look this this is a 22 ton payload it's I think the one of the heaviest so far and this booster will be able to give it 11 and a half meters per second of delta V that's including the one point something meter per second kilometer per second delta V the thing has itself it should be enough to get it in onto orbit but there's not a huge margin of error so let's fiddle the fairings into place and see about launching that. I'm going to launch it uncrewed. Um, look there's no crew in it and instead the plan is to put this in orbit and then have the crew of the now defunct Tech Lab 1 uh, rendezvous with it and then occupy that. So uh, no new Kerbals are needed and the old ones are not forgotten. They need to occupy the new laboratory. Um, as I said earlier in the episode, the laboratory is the stock, Kerbal, uh, st stock game laboratory. It's heavy and it's useless, but I figure it serves as a nice space station hub. And if we ever do get some technology uh, if you ever do get some experiments attached to that station that need resetting then the station can uh, do that so with that said let's proceed and launch it and of course because this launch will take again 15 minutes or so i will show it to you see you in orbit hopefully and there we are safely in orbit we have 700 meters per second of delta v remaining so not a huge amount but we are comfortably in orbit. Let's deploy everything that we have. We have four solar panels to keep this station, let's call it a station from now on, to keep it constantly powered up. Here we go, and of course we have the experiments. The seismic data doesn't work, but we have the sensor just in case. The temperature scan, that works, but we already did that, so we can trash that data. And now the big moment, the magnetometer. Let's take a reading from that. Deploy both of them as well, just for aesthetic purposes. Activate the magnetometer, that's surely looking nice on the space station. And lock the magnetosphere data. That's 20 points for recovery and 12 points for transmission. The problem is, if we transmit it, we notice that there are no comms devices on the vessel. Oh no, we forgot to include any so this is immediately where the well the modular nature will come in handy of course the first module that will go up to the station will include um, antennae of course for now we are going to grab the crew from the other habitat it's in a similar orbit so rendezvousing should not be that much of a problem we're going to grab that crew and um, they can go back and forth on EVA and transmit the data in that fashion, at least that's what I'm counting on. If not, it will just have to wait until a suitably antennate module can be attached to this station. Speaking of attaching, it's about time we jettison this, um, well, this, this command pod. It is a command pod. So let's point this uh, station retrograde, lock the SAS there and of course without this module it doesn't have any reaction control system so it's probably doomed to tumbling. So before we release this we have to stabilize the station and then it can remain in that fashion. So deeming this good enough, it can tumble for a bit for all I care. We are not docking yet, we are moseying over on EVA. So decouple that node, there goes the command there's no way to control this this bit anymore until we get some crew in there so let's switch to this and see if we can't deorbit it um, with nothing but these separatrons attached to the side going to point straight retrograde and see how far they go so firing them no firing them no firing the separatrons can i please fire the separatrons um, The staging won't let me fire the separatrons, and if I fire just the one, of course this will happen. Mm, 
Well, I can try that one more time. Activate the engine. Well, there we go. I don't think we've deorbited. We are just spinning away from the lab, but at least we are spinning away from it. So that's something at any rate. So let's switch to the Tech Lab 1. And they will have to meet up with the Tech Lab 2 so that they can, well, transfer. Here we are setting that as a target. It is ahead of us. So if we if we slow down a bit we should catch up with them again somewhere oh look at that no if we slow down a bit we will catch up with them in one orbit at a distance of 67 that's still a bit high hundred and forty what's the altitude we're currently at here we're too high mm. I can get this to 70 then this is at 180 let's see how much Delta V do we have we're 1300 meters per second of Delta V so we might as well go for the 68 kilometer separation that should Ah, that is a bit slow. Waste heat is at zero. Can we con we can control it? In fact, there is crew in here, right? Where is our crew? Yes, there they are. So I'm going to burn for 33 seconds this way. It's going to be a bit of a hack job rendezvous. Let's see how close we can get it. Oh no! Um, I uh, did a cardinal error where I would put my periapsis inside the planet. And then, of course, on the next pass, yeah, sure, we are going to meet up with the station, but also crash and die before that could ever happen. So I'm going to go the other way, I'm going to boost the orbit instead. Ooh, that is a lot of Delta V. We can't do that, so... No, 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 I'm just going to boost the orbit a little bit so that we will not crash and burn. And then I'm going to try a orbit boosting rendezvous maneuver. God, orbit orbital mechanics is a pain. It is such a pain. So, here we go, boosting, boosting, boosting. Right, and now... Oh, the problem is we are orbiting slightly below this one. Uh, anyway, I'm going to figure out this rendezvous stuff and then I will talk to you when that's done. So, in the end we made it. We are en route to the Tech Lab 2 and I induced a tumble into the Tech Lab 1 because, uh, well, it's hard to steer it without lighting the engine. So, now that it's tumbling, I can just wait for a proper alignment and light the engine then. At least that was the point. We are passing the station while I'm talking at you. So, here we go a small amount of speed and we are not on a course for a collision but we are going to zoom past it and in this well sort of uh, haphazard rendezvous I am going to eject the crew and have them EVA over to uh, there they are have Corky go first EVA him over to the other station RCS on and let's move on over to the tech lab too. Now the plan is to first move over these kerbals, the two of them, then with the two of them process the magnetosphere data in the in the tech lab two, then one of them will go outside on EVA again and return to the tech lab one with that science data to use its antennae and uh, transmit that data home. So we have some something to show for this mission. Uh, after that, the one in the Tech Lab 1 will point it retrograde, light the engine and then quickly get out so that hopefully that Tech Lab number 1 will deorbit itself. Now that's a quite a daring mission and well there might be casualties involved but I think it's um, in the vein of this space program. This moving rendezvous, I'm I'm liking that a lot. This 
these stations will not stay close together for a long time. Their relative velocity is about 3, 4, maybe even 5 meters per second. But uh, that is long enough for jumping over to the much more capable and new station. The most important difference is, of course, that this one has docking ports, so it can and will be expanded in the future, which is, of course, a very, very good. So let's approach the ladder. Grab that, please, and enter the station. So now we can do the magnetosphere data, at least I think so. I wonder why that won't let me do the science. Oh no! Is it because there's not actually a command pod on here? So anything with control doesn't work? Yeah, oh no, I can't control this. I just have the scientists in the in the lab, but they don't have controls over the over the things. Oh, that is a problem. So, first thing that is going to happen is a control pod will be attached to this thing. So, maybe a Kerbal on EVA can do it. Dual technique magnetometer, no damage. Well, that's good, I suppose. Is there maybe some data in this one that we can grab and then take inside of the laboratory to for processing? No, ah, that's lame. So they are sitting here in their space station, completely unable to do any signal processing whatsoever. So they're just waiting for, uh, well, for the next module with nuclear power and antennae and stuff. Of course, um, our mission with the our mission to deorbit the other station. I'm still going to attempt that. I'm going to have to be quick. Bobcat is going to be off doing that. Do we have? Did they get a refill of their EVA propellant? That they did. What this guy is going to do? He's going to catch up to the Tech Lab One that's rapidly receding. Point it retrograde. Fire the engine and then get out and. EVA back to the Tech Lab 2. If the distances don't become too great, that can work. And of course, the point is to not leave any orbital debris to keep the equatorial Earth orbit nice and clean. So, this EVA over to the Tech Lab 1 will take a while. I will see you when I'm there. And there we are approaching the Tech Lab. The 200 meters have successfully been bridged, and this derelict will soon be shooting off back towards the planet, at least. That is the plan. I think the Delta V remaining in the tanks are, uh, well, let's have a look actually. It's 270. Yeah, that should be enough, I think. Problem is, of course, we need to light the engine very slowly to even be able to turn. So that is going to cost us a few meters per second of Delta V, but really not more than a few. Now here comes the challenge. I'm going to light this engine full clip, hit the SAS on and then bail out the Kerbal. So, let's see, lock in the direction, full throttle, and eject the Kerbal by, uh, even he, he already picked up so much speed that he is going to have to do a lot of braking to catch back up to the Tech Lab 2. Fortunately, that is possible. I think he let go just in time because any more any more well delta v needed would be would take a long time anyway that tech lab number one is rocketing off into the distance <laughs> with no people on board and hopefully that will uh, end up deorbited now to get back to tech lab two i will need to thrust in that direction for a while well we did manage to overcome the speed imparted by the tech lab one and we are now approaching it. Well, this will again take a while, so I'll see you when everything is in order and we're back. And here we are zooming up to the tech lab. We approached rather quickly, but with some expenditure of jetpack fuel that was all solved. It is a bit of a bummer that the experiments appear to be uncontrollable from the inside of the laboratory. We need a command pod for that. So that will be on the next mission to this, uh, well, to this space station. And my intention was to make this an episode with many different missions. Um, on the other hand, uh, whoops, that's the TV making noise. 
I think with these two there has been enough material for a full episode already so I'm going to render it like this and tomorrow you will see some more moon missions and hopefully some progress to this space station. So thanks for watching, this was Lorenzo and you've been watching Gay Speech of Mars and I want you to click all the social media buttons if you happened to like anything you saw. Oh wait, before we are in fact leaving let's switch to the Tech Lab 1 and see how that got on. If it if it in fact deorbited because that would be amazing would it not well the fuel has run out that's for sure and yep that will deorbit great it worked let's accelerate time and see that happen the fruits of that brave kerbal there it goes into the atmosphere accelerating the time at four times physical time warp because we don't need this trash anymore and we don't want to spend any time watching it well any time that we don't need to I want to see this burn up and explode so go that's incinerating nicely it was such an achievement to get the heavy laboratory up into space and then without doing any science on it at all we are now just crashing it back to the planet so here come the explosions, oh no, no one's in there. Hope the peace over our cities, but we don't have any cities. Oh, fire, explosions, I have no idea what's going on. Hey, this is cool, cool again. Periphery stuff is exploding, but not the core, the core lab. Go, oh, we're coming up to 10 Gs now. Lots of G forces on this puppy. And of course, uh, well, it, it is breaking up fairly bad, that's one thing that's for sure. But the lab is strangely resistant to heating. We're decelerating at 14 Gs here, and it's, it, it's cooling. It's cooling. This lab is apparently the best heat shield in the world. It's just impervious to heat, it's cooling, it's slowly, slowly cooling. So it weighs 10 tons. But it might just be the perfect re-entry gasket. If you stick some kerbals in here, well, fill the rest of the interior space with acceleration couches. And, well, they might just survive anything, really. I suppose they built it to last and be sturdy, so... It's not going to burn up. Instead, it's going to crash into the surface. A much more mundane, more boring uh, fate for a a piece of sophisticated space hardware like this. And now that I started this I want to, to show you the end but this is tedious so I'm hitting the time warp just a few more kilometers and then that will crash. Then there's one more thing that I'm gonna do because I never did that before which is check out, ooh there's the ground, hello ground, bam. Now what I want to do is check out the interior, interior view of um, of that space lab see if that's any good if there's laboratory files and you know stuff so fly the lab around Kerbin and we need to need to have a module with some antennae up there so that we might transmit but I'm going to wait until we have generators for the nuclear plants so that we can have a lot of energy as well I don't know why but it starts out very zoomed out here we go zooming in up to that science station and let us time warp so that it is in the daylight which is of course the much nicer side to be on here we are in the daytime and we might get an interior no we no there's no interior view at least I don't know how to get in there well as I said a while ago this is Lorenzo you've been watching KSP to Mars click the like button the share and the subscribe and the comments and all those other good things Thanks for watching. See you tomorrow. This has gone long enough. Goodbye.